to um, be, you know, in a position to host inspiration and adaptation, a weekly dialogue exploring artists innovations and adaptations. The Nell Street Art Center is situated within the tribal lands of Nichiltana, the Nilchik village tribe, whose descendants trace their roots from the ancient Kechemak peoples, the Denaina, the Denaina and Supiak peoples of this region. These people have sustained these lands since time immemorial. And Benel is committed to resisting colonialism by partnering with indigenous artists and supporting indigenous led practices. This week, Shared Universe Book Club reimagines the Arctic and alternative histories of Alaska. Nathan Schaefer is um, joining me with many guests and participants in this project. We'll discuss Dirigibles of Denali, an augmented reality app and interactive print project that reimagines three dome cities that were planned but never built in Alaska. Seward Success, Denali, City, and Arctic Town. I'm so pleased that several of the uh, participants in this project are with me here today. And starting with Nathan, I'm just going to ask you all to introduce yourselves and um, then we'll move into some questions and some images. Thank you so much and welcome. Nathan. Thank, Thank you, you, Asia. It's really cool to see everybody's faces. So my name is Nathan Schaefer. I am a new media artist from Alaska and my focus has been augmented reality for the last couple of years as I'm switching more into digital humanities. Uh, th this project was Dirigibles of Denali was in 2018 and we got a lot of really cool writers from Alaska together to all write short fiction pieces set in these cities in an Alaska that never mm -hmm. was. And uh, I'm I've always wanted to like get with all these people together because it was all so disparate. Like everybody was working individual. And even though we had a nice little Facebook group where we could communicate, we never had this. And uh, I'm just unbelievably excited to hear everybody talk about it right now. So I'm gonna stop. Well, thank you, Nathan. It's delightful to have you. And I see many other participants in the project here. I'm just gonna move over to Lucas Raleigh and ask you, Lucas, to share with us a self-introduction and, and your role in the project. You're muted, Lucas. Thanks. Yay, unmuted. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm Lucas Raleigh. I'm actually originally from Homer, so I, I like to go down there and visit a lot. Um, but I started off uh, as an artist and then I did playwriting. I worked with Richard and Josh uh, in the theater world and I've always been a science fiction writer. So um, Nathan contacted me about this project and I just wrote a little science fiction story uh, about my favorite caribou hunting spot up on the Denali Highway and inserted it into this world of uh, the tent city and the dir dirigibles and everything. It was just a lot of fun. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Richard, it's great to have you back. Richard Perry, tell us a little bit about your role with this project. Sure. So uh, just to feedback off of what Lucas says, uh, you know, I really am into science fiction as well. <laughs> and in fact, when when we first met at uh, where we worked at Cook Inlet Tribal Council several a decade or so ago, uh, he recognized the chirp on my phone as a Star Trek sound. So fellow nerd alert. <laughs> Um, so I'm like uh, Richard Perry from Anchorage, Alaska, and I moved here as an adult uh, when I was uh, 34 and uh, really uh, was interested in kind of rediscovering my connection to my Alaska Native heritage. And uh, part of that process, uh, I also joined Lucas in the playwright workshop that uh, he was in. And uh, my, my love of writing really took off and uh, the sense of collaboration and kind of a shared environment and creativity was just something that I, I still enjoy to do now. And it's uh, something that uh, is central to the work that I do. Um, so that's a, that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Richard. Terrific. Thanks so much for joining us. Jacqueline, Jacqueline Bergamino, welcome. Lovely to see you today. Thank you, Asia. Um, yeah, I'm Jacqueline. I have an MFA in creative writing from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I used to teach creative writing there. Um, yeah. 
Terrific. And so, and you're a contributing writer in this project? Yes, I am. This was my first speculative fiction. Oh, Fantastic. Really well, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's move over to Joshua Medster. Welcome, Joshua. And you might need to unmute there. I am not hearing you. Is anybody else hearing Joshua? No. Nope. Okay. Oh, no. Joshua, I'm going to recommend that you just restart and try rejoining us. And then I'm going to just scooch on over to Melissa Shaganoff and welcome Melissa. It's always fantastic Wait. to have you with us. Oh, Can you guys there you are. Me now? Yes. Welcome. <laughs> Great okay. to hear yeah, you. I had my Bluetooth headphones on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I, I usually use. Um, I, I, I just got done with a day of teaching. I'm kind of spaced out right now. Um, I usually use Zoom and um, not super familiar familiar with, oh wait, this is Zoom. Yeah. WebEx, I usually use WebEx. Um, hey, uh, good, good to, to see you. everybody. Um, so what was the question? How, how did I get involved with yeah, dirigibles? If you could give us a self-introduction and how you became involved with the project. Thank you. So, I got involved with this project through Nathan. Um, he, he called me up and wanted to know if I wanted to be involved with this. Um, I've known Nathan for a long time. We went to UAA together in the mid late nineties. And um, I, I, I'm not super uh, adept at, at fiction writing actually. I'm a, a poet, but uh, anything that Nathan tells me to do, I do it. And um, I've been trying my hand at speculative uh, fiction and poetry and uh, generally just trying to get into uh, futurism and transhumanism. Uh, it's you know, very curious to me. So, so this, this was something I wanted to uh, take a look at. And yeah, um, um, Nathan and uh, a friend of his, uh, Adimola, and I, um, and, and Joel, his, his wife, uh, Nathan's wife, we, we did a little bit of uh, uh, Denali Dome stuff in, in Philadelphia a couple years ago. Uh, and that, that's kind of how I got started with this. Um, so I wrote a couple of stories um, that are in the Dirigibles um, anthology. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how, how I got started couple of uh, BMX uh, type of type of uh, things. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us, Joshua. Yeah. Also in this anthology is Vivian Faith Prescott, who's just joining us. And I see you're still muted, Vivian, but I just wanted to invite you to the circle to um, welcome you and to ask if you might just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you became involved in the dirigibles of Denali Project as a writer. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. It took a while to uh, figure out the technology, even though I supposedly know the technology to get in. But I was invited by Nathan to uh, contribute to this project. And at first I thought, wow, this is so complex. I mean, um, he wanted me to write for uh, a story and I thought, I had heard of the um, dome cities and stuff like that before because I was born in the 60s. So I did hear a little bit about it, but I thought this was really fascinating, even though I wasn't sure what augmented reality was and all those things he was talking about and so excited, but I think it was his excitement that drew me to the project. So I was uh, working on some stories kind of based on Sami girl and Sami woman. And I thought maybe I could write specifically to that piece or what he was working on the project. So mm -hmm. and as I developed, my mind was just blown about the technology and all the stories and the many layers of this project. So fantastic. So happy to have and, you with us today. And I write uh, poetry, nonfiction and um, fiction so it wasn't too much to come up with this this whole world and reality because I have written in this genre before. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, and there are several other writers in the project who may be joining us, including Leslie Kamiko Ward, Skywalker Payne, 
Uh, Patrick Lichty is with us as well. Patrick, would you um, provide a self-introduction? Okay, and I'll try to keep it short, is that Nathan and I have been working together on this project for a long time. Uh, we were actually part of this, uh, um, I think the first contemporary art AR group called Manifest AR, and where I found out about his um, exit, uh, uh, exit Glacier Terminus project, which uh, I actually came up and saw. And the thing is that while I'm not uh, Alaska, I'm originally from Ohio, and um, I'm now in Minnesota, just got back from Abu Dhabi. The thing is, is that a lot of my heritage is Alaskan, is that I had an uncle who worked on the um, Alaska Railroad and my father served in World War II at uh, NAFSA, uh, uh, ADAC, which and while he was dying, I went out and I did a documentary on it, which hasn't been, never been produced because it was really primarily for my father. But in, going out and seeing the exit glacier project with with nathan you know we were kind of talking about you know this this project that he was thinking of and um you know as and i was thinking about bruce sterling's call for 22nd century science fiction and you know the i'm just fascinated by all these things that nathan had found and um you know we'd already been working in ar and um yeah you know, my project uh you know my my contribution to it um you know the, the archive uh, was uh you know i i would um kind of set up a lot of the um sh you know the the parallel universe structure on on this thing and the thing is is that uh while i've been in arabia for five years and haven't been as involved with the project and nathan's done such an amazing job with building this thing and brought in so many amazing people i'm glad to be back in america and and seeing where this is where this has gone and um, hopefully being a bit more active. And I'm really humbled to see where this has gone. Fantastic. It's so great to have you with us, Patrick. So this is um, a room that is open to, you know, any uh, listeners um, that might be out there on, on Facebook Live and, and other places. I want to just acknowledge that it's really an honor to have the, you know, listening attention of, of Hollis McGee from the Anchorage Museum and a prominent artist in her own right, Carol Mears, Adele Person, Executive Director of Bunnell Street Art Center, and also Melissa Shaganoff, who's a key partner in the Shared Universe Project, um, although not specifically in this book. And I just want to welcome you, Melissa, and everyone else, and invite anybody who might like to introduce themselves if they have a, a key kind of question they hope to share or something we might discuss. This is a great time to you know, unmute and chime in. All right. Well, if nobody wants to chime in, yeah, no? Hey, Melissa, thumbs up to you. So let's, um, let's talk about this, um, this project. Uh, I understand that Dirigibles of Denali is a culmination of several collaborative augmented reality and digital humanities projects um, approaching uh, three of Alaska's planned cities, Seward Success, Denali City, and Arctic City. All three cities are virtually constructed at their original locations using mobile augmented reality technology and accompanying these augmented reality cities are 10 pieces of speculative fiction by Alaskan artists, some of whom are with us today, imagining a world where these cities had actually been built and an alternative history of Alaska, reflecting that reality. So Nathan, tell us um, basically um, how you got into this project and why you picked these writers. Let's sort of step back and see kind of um, and, okay. and others, of course, are welcome uh, to chime in. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a, a little bit. I'm I'm very, very interested. Um, oh, my goodness. I, I really want to uh, get into some conversations between the people because of some similarities I found. But uh, I, I got into the project because I had built Seward Success already for a, a Rasmussen Foundation Award. And then for some reason, uh, Patrick and I got invited to speak at the New Media Caucus in Washington, D.C about the collaborative project we were working on. The only problem is we weren't working on a collaborative project. Um, and it was it was nearing the time that we needed to go speak. So um, we just kind of made this project really quick and it was just gonna be an AR project. And then the more time uh, we spent with the cities because they are 
on indigenous lands. And the, there are certain things that are, are that come up a lot when you start looking at the idea of a dome city in the Arctic. And, and that's a, one of the big things is colonialism and building mm -hmm. an environment that uh, is hospitable to white people's comfort levels in the Arctic. And that's what you've had for decades with the polar city ideas, you know, this north to the future idea. Um, so I was, I had that in my head that it was a big colonial thing. And then as I started talking to other friends, I realized that there was a major shift that had occurred that I hadn't thought about and that a dome city was uh, a cons like a archeological thing. It was a way of conserving the nature that's eroding right now. So we see it as a way of fighting climate change, which is not part of the fiction back then. Uh, so I started talking to friends about who are the science fiction writers in Alaska. And I knew Richard and I knew um, he introduced me to Lucas really quick. So there, Richard was the one that kind of punched the nerd card for me. Like he would be the one I would say science fiction, he would know. Um, so I remember talking to him and I think it was seconds later, he's like, I'm gonna tell Lucas about this. <laughs> and then um, it kind of started going. And then I realized the the science fiction is something that everybody's writing, whether they're like 100% into it or not, we're, we're dealing with those issues all the time. And um, I think with a lot of Alaskans, they they don't want the genre stigma of, of science fiction, uh, but they're more than willing to, to write it and talk about it. It's actually really interesting to them. So having people um, like Vivian, who wrote one of the most amazing stories, or uh, even Skywalker or Leslie, just everybody contributed so deeply. Um, but when we were doing it, I just said, hey, we want speculative fiction set in the dome cities. These are the dome cities, bare minimum thoughts. And I didn't give assignments. Like I didn't say, Lucas, I want you to write Denali City, Jacqueline, your Arctic. Like I didn't divvy it up. Um, everybody just picked their own thing. And then when everybody picked their own thing, they started, uh, it, it, it just, it had its own presence about it. And then the similarities became, most people generated towards Denali City because it was made, but whether they consciously picked it or not, it was made by an Alaskan who had an intimate knowledge of what Alaska looks and feels like. So the city didn't ooze of other things. It actually seems like, why didn't we build this city? This would have been rad. Um, the other ones, it, 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 the, just to see the way they all sort of interspersed. You know, Vivian's story has this zoo-like quality. And uh, Leslie wrote about a zoo in the middle, like um, <laughs> Denali City's on fire and they're trying to save all the elephants. Uh, Richard and Lucas have, and um, Jacqueline too, um, Jacqueline's less of like a, a, a future, like almost a dystopian future, but I, I don't like that word all the way. It was just, it was amazing to watch it all come together. Fantastic. Thank you for that bit of orientation. And we can shift right into the, the dialogues or questions that you might want to see unfold. I've, I've got questions myself and I, and I, I really, you know, Benel's really um, privileged to host a space for shared universe. And so I think it's important that this goes in the direction that, that you and the participants really would like to, um, you know, explore. So do you, do you want me to uh, keep throwing out some questions or w would you like to um, pose some questions as a sort of point of dialogue for the artists? Oh, you're muted. Oh, there we go. But unmute, Nathan. Yep. There we go. Brilliant. All right. What I would actually like to do is I would like to get some of our authors um, talking about it. I, uh, since Richard is really uh, the one who started the shared universe in this iteration where we're making comic books and things now. I would like Richard to, to kind of guide us through initially him and Lucas, and then I, I would like everybody who wrote a story to talk really briefly about their story. Um, and I think that, that we're gonna be running out of time soon, even doing that. Sure. Um, but I would like everybody that, the chance to talk about their story and relationship. Brilliant. So we'll start with Richard guiding us. Brilliant. Thank you, Richard. Super. So uh, first off, I don't want to take credit for starting it. I, I just asked questions. Uh, would this be cool <laughs> to do? Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, part of the shared universe thing 
that's a, just continued a conversation. This this is really cool. Let's let's talk about this and write that. Um, so the Wildman of Denali, or Denali and the Wildman in this title, um, the short story as Nathan had shared uh, was centered on Denali City, and uh, the the great thing about science fiction uh, is that it's really an opportunity to talk about. Uh, issues, contemporary issues uh, with a with a veil. And that veil, you know, gives you a lot of liberty and freedom to discuss things that are important or, uh, you know, worthwhile to, to mention in a, a greater narrative, uh, so that it, uh, you know, it can it can reach people on on multiple levels, not just with the science fiction, but also addressing uh, things that are uh, complex and difficult to see in your own contemporary view, uh, you know, with things with their names and such as they are. Um, in this city, one of the things that uh, I really liked about it was that um, it, it was a future and I wanted to take some older stories from uh, some of my family stories that I've heard and uh, the wild men, uh, you know, from, from my family stories, I heard uh, there were um, people who were removed from the village and uh, they would come back and periodically raid and uh, they would take they would take uh, you know women and food and and stuff like that from villages and they were just considered you know wild men beast men and that's where we kind of get the uh, I like to think that's where we kind of get the idea of Sasquatch and the Bigfoot tales is um, you know uh, these people who are not quite human maybe greater than and uh, they just uh, appear and mysteriously disappear uh, it's uh, it was a lot of fun to kind of populate this with ideas uh, in in my particular story uh, it's it's populated mostly by artists musicians and uh, that's that's what i thought would be cool uh, you don't have to work most of the food and, and needs are taken care of by you know um, a structure within the city uh, kind of a computer operated thing. And uh, so need wasn't such a driving force in this community as, as uh, you know, entertainment and culture and art and music and all the things that I love and adore that uh, don't always get full billing in, uh, in the wider communities and in the wider culture. Um, the other thing that I thought was important uh, that I wanted to express in my story was that there's not really a central hero. It's really kind of a family, a family dynamic that uh, resolves the issues that come to them. It's it's not just uh, one person centered. It's broader. It's uh, this family that come together and they they have challenges and they overcome them together. And and there's no uh, you know prime. Uh, culture or prime aspect to a hero. It's it's really kind of a family centered thing. Um, so maybe I could just leave it there. And Nathan or Lucas, if you have any questions that you might uh, suppose. Uh, I mean, so the the Wild Men of Denali. We should also mention um, is going to be the first of these stories that the Shared Universe Group is turning into a graphic novel. Um, so we're currently working on on that one. Um, it, it's super super great story. It, it's going to be an even funner comic book, I think, because of the 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 wild men and the Sasquatch aspect of it. It's just <laughs> it's uh, it's fun. So I I liked what, so one of the things I liked about that was uh, this horror aspect that's coming in with it. So this this idea of the Sasquatch or whatever. Um, we want to call it that was also present in Lucas's story. Um, he, he had a, a horror element that was built into it. Would you care to explain your story, Mr. Rowley? Sure. Um, and I, I just liked uh, Richard's story because of the technology and the dome and the, the materials, and the computer stuff. But yeah, it's funny. He mentioned we, I, we met him because I heard his Star Trek chirp. Uh, the next question was, do you play Dungeons and Dragons? And then we started this huge bromance after that. But um, so my story was outside the dome and uh, it was really fun to put it in this universe. Um, 
and I had a character named Smitty and I just liked that name. I wish my name was Smitty. It's like an old sourdough name. There was a tattoo guy named Smitty. My dad hi hauled me off to an auction for some estate or guy named Smitty. There's guys in Homer named Smitty. So I, <laughs> I use this character named Smitty, but um, I hope we do a, set, a part two of this project because I think I, I would have just in the last few years, technology has changed so much. I would have wrote it differently. I'm flying drones now. Um, I've been reading a lot of steampunk and, and for some reason, this whole dome city just really just reeks of steampunk technology. So um, I really hope we do a, a second part of this, but just in a, uh, in a nutshell, my story was a cautionary tale about farmed salmon, sort of. There was a native corporation and they were, they were messing around with genetics and they made these wolf men that escaped and they were wreaking havoc on the caribou population. And so this guy comes in and uh, to take care of the wolf problem and uh, it's, it's this big battle up on the Denali highway that's been overgrown. Um, so it was just a lot of fun. But like I said, there's gotta be a part two because with the way technology is growing, all of our stories are just gonna uh, morph into something else, so. There's room for more comic books, Lucas. All right, let's do, it. <laughs> let's do it. I mean, so that also brings up a, another point that uh, I hadn't predicted, but felt really good to see. Uh, there was a little bit when Patrick and I would put ideas together was just how much it made more and more ideas. But so many people that wrote short stories here would continue on. Like um, I know Jacqueline and, and Skywalker both wanted to read a, uh, write a full length novel based on this stuff. Like it, 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 it was, it was very generative. Um, and when we would talk with each other in the Facebook group or whatever, it, it became even more generative. And uh, I, I would like to talk about uh, Josh Metzger here when, because that's one of the things him and I, uh, our, our artistic practice is more about generative interaction with people. So that's something that we would purposefully work on. And um, we, inside of all the stories, we had created also this, rea this fake re Alaska reality TV show called Dirigibles of Denali that would follow people who were on Dirigible Crews to all the dome cities. And so there was part of the fiction inside of the story was, I, I don't know, just basically telling about the television episodes of this story, but it was all collaboratively written with people. Uh, so that collaborative fiction became, an, it, it got super goofy and weird. Uh, and the goofiest one we had to start the story off with, but I'm going to out Josh. He wrote that one. It was, it was hilarious. Uh, and then we, we, it ended up becoming like a whole separate book. One of the characters write a book of poetry uh, at some point, but Josh, I want you to talk about your very short little story and how all the strange things you did. And then I would like to talk to Vivian, actually. I'm going to have to oh, keep yeah. it. Wait, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, I actually have all that stuff here, uh, Nathan. So my um, my story was called um, Saturday Night at, at the Denali Dome. And my uh, idea was kind of, I don't know, I, I, I've never actually seen this movie, but I've, I've heard it referenced so many times. Uh, I'll just say what's uh, uh, Death Race 3000, is that right? It's kind of like a futuristic uh, hack and slash sports theme uh, theme going on. So the characters with uh, Sour Doc and Batman, th those were the two kids that were involved with this with this thing, right? So it's it's like a like a, like a like a, a skate park, right? So the so these two teenagers are on. Um, I don't even know what you'd call it. They're like electro bikes, right? But they they have these what did I call them? Electro lances, right? And they they basically just knock the crap out of each other. That's the idea. But the 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 idea for for Denali City, um, my understanding was that it's it's entertainment and culture and stuff like that. But I've always liked. Um, God help me, 
in the in the in the second Star Wars movie, the Attack of the Clones, I, I I personally thought that the coolest scenes were the like the future the future cities, right, where they're like way up in the sky with the flying cars and stuff. So that's you know kind of a uh, like a really like in my mind like a dark futuristic view of uh, uh, of a city, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but in, in, in my mind, it was more like, like th this, this is where people come to, you know, get their yayas out and see, you know, see people, you know, charging at each other with, with electro bikes. And I thought it was pretty fun. And like Nathan said, um, we did all sorts of things with this. We had a, uh, like a, a separate um poet well here Nate that you you can explain it better but basically I have like a little small press out here in New Jersey and we published some of those um but we had an anonymous chat book series going on out here it was it was insane but you you can explain it Nathan yeah so uh part of uh Josh's practice out there with 24 hours was um this anonymous chat book project that had um uh, um, sorry, um, the, I just got a text and I can't read it and talk at the same time, apparently. What was I talking about? Oh, your chapbook project. Yeah. So the, the chapbooks. Anonymously and pseudonymously. Is, there, was a, there was a character in the reality show who had a dirigible blimp, whose name was Peach. Right. He, he was like this, um, honestly, like kind of this amalgamation of white guilt in, um, I don't know, like the, the well-meaning liberal that is 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 all about trying to right the wrongs of the world. And, and it's like this reverse white savior complex. I, I just, I'm very attracted to that character. Like it's, it's uh, I'm probably like, it, it's probably like a parody of, of my own personal things that I'm embarrassed to admit that I think about. And it, it just, it kind of strikes home really deep for me. I, I love that character. But uh, the way this character would express himself was was in writing poetry, and um, that became part of the show, inside the fiction and um, all the video games and stuff. And yeah, we were we uh, put together a poetry book written by this man, um, and it, I, that got like way off topic. Um, the, the the entertainment value though is is the thing that was super important. Um, so when Vivian told me the idea for her story, um, which was based on, on a lot of reality of um, people being put in cages. Uh, the Sami, for instance, were, were put in cages and people would come and, and watch them. Um, the famous one, uh, Ishi and Otabinga were, were people that were put in cages and kept in museums. And, and, and um, that idea of turning people into an attraction at the zoo was part of Vivian's story, uh, which was set in Seward Success. Would you like to talk about that for a second, Vivian? I will. Yeah, I, I was interested because I'd been researching human zoos and I learned that the Sami were uh, part of that movement in uh, Scandinavia. So they, they were put in zoos hired for being in zoos. So I kind of wanted to incorporate that in there. So I have kind of a climate change, um, kind of cult-like behavior is going on um, with the colonial world there. And uh, I also set it in way into the future, a couple hundred years in, from my future, uh, my world into, uh, and so I kind of changed the name to, to New Seward because uh, climate disasters had happened. And, and so the, the Seward success was rebuilt. And uh, anyway, so I incorporated traditional knowledge too in there with the story of the origin of the Northern Lights, one of the stories. But I did wanna do, I wanted to write about a human zoo. And so when this opportunity came up, I thought, well, how can I fit this into this, this plan? And, but it kind of all came together at the same time. So it was a fun story. And I, I, like the other writers too, I'm thinking, wow, maybe I'm gonna write more stories. And I do have stories about Sami girl and Sami woman that haven't really 
come to anything. Maybe there'll be a separate collection. This this may be in there, or I may um, extend these characters. But this this character basically Ada. She's in. She's been raised in a human zoo. So. Wow. And I thought, well, what would I do the if thing like Stephen King says, if, what if, and so that was what if someone was raised in a human zoo, what, what would their life be like? Uh, it was, it, um, so the poetry of your writing came through really, really big. Like this was a very lyrical uh, story it, for as intense and hard as some of those things are that you were dealing with. Um, but I thought it was interesting. So out of all the other people, we might not have talked about this as a group. I think you had the idea for your story, but you, I wouldn't say it was a struggle. It was maybe more of a concern. You didn't know which city you should pick to write the stories in. And, and it was kind of locating that, it, which um, actually kind of makes sense for your, your story in some bizarre way. But um, I think it was because the idea of that city is, is such a, it's, it is a colonial enterprise. It's a, it's a setting up something for, it, it was all based on oil extraction and how much wealth can you extract from Alaska. That was the idea of this city, was the city of gold. Um, so it was kind of a perfect place for your zoo. And if, uh, it wasn't just Sami in your story, it was Alaska natives in, in, in not enclosures, is that the right word for this? Yeah, I, I call them habitats, but they had uh, Inupiaq and um, different Athabascan communities, things like that. So there was, I'm not sure if it says exactly how many, but there definitely was. You could go see the humans in, in natural environment, in the unnatural environment, I guess. There was a lot of irony in the whole piece. Yes. Uh, I, I, I love that. I, I would like to um, make sure I get everybody. Jacqueline wrote a story set in Arctic City, which, um, the way for this project, we located it on a peninsula um, southeast of Kotzebue, where uh, it wasn't originally intended for that. It was sort of a kind of like a mobile city that would have been easily constructed multiple times was the idea of it, but it would be all over the Arctic and they would kind of daisy chain them together to make bigger cities. And Jacqueline's story did play a lot with what Vivian was talking about this idea of um, the natural and then um, sort of the man-made, but still uh, steep somehow in the natural. Would you like to talk about your story, Jacqueline? Yeah, so I feel like I had um, the lucky experience of getting to go to the UAF archives and <laughs> dig up some of the original like memos and drawings and stuff. Um, and to me, um, I'm originally from Florida. I grew up not, not very far from Disney World. And to me, a lot of the creation reminded me of that, of Epcot and Celebration and Seaside and these kinds of places that were like constructed for tourism. <laughs> um, and I think so for me, it was interesting to kind of explore um, this idea of creating a place that meets tourists' expectations instead of letting tourists come to the actual place um, and, and being like completely insulated and, and domed off from the outside world. Um, and so in my story, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of facsimile and trying to create that natural world inside. Um, and it kind of snowballed into also being um, a surveillance state. And um, I said it after the heyday of the tourism. And so it, it's kind of this um, 
you can really see the way that the facade is crumbling. Um, and I felt like I really loved what Richard said earlier about um, let it like basically unveiling things in our real lives, like these kinds of projects, these writing projects of speculative and sci-fi fiction um, kind of gives us the opportunity, like for me, it gave me the opportunity to take these things that are in the real world and insidious and kind of hidden and underlying and like really bring them to the forefront um, and explore them that way. Awesome. Um, there, so in, oh, sorry, uh, the other Arctic City project, the, uh, Patrick wrote a story set in Arctic City um, that's connected to another one. Now, Jacqueline's story, correct me if I'm wrong, Jacqueline, uh, you are turning into a longer book project. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I need to write these down again keep track of them because there, there's so many in um, hearing Lucas talk about doing a part two and hearing Vivian talk about uh, doing a next part to it actually gets me very very excited about the thought of, of doing these again as we recreate them like the the AR stuff when we made it back in 2017 2018 doesn't exist anymore like that whole platform is gone so um, I'm actually currently remaking them and we're going to be premiering them I think in April as an app that's going to connect to the shared universe app to do augments on the comic books and things. But um, I, I think it's high time some of us get together and figure out if there's a part two. Um, there's actually, we had some weird publishing issues, but there's a publisher who's interested in this as a tourist book now. Um, oh. so we're, we're, I'm kind of trying to figure out what that would look like if this book was actually in all of those little tchotchke Alaskana shops. I, it, it, I have no problem with it there. I think it's actually fine there. But uh, the thought of it is kind of funny to me to, to see that um, mostly because of how authentically interesting these stories are and how uh, they weren't kind of forced out of anybody it was just kind of a very general statement. We're doing this. You know, we asked a lot of people that didn't write stories, but these are the people that did. And these stories are all magical and amazing. And it, them being together is, it, reading this book from cover to cover is a very weird, fun, crazy experience. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense how fun it should, how fun it is. And it, it's amazing to watch the, the next step, which the, the step after this was that we started making comic books because we had so much extra content that we didn't use in the stories. Uh, so Richard and I both are doing that and I'm excited to do more. Um, Patrick, who also, you know, we, we designed the project as an AR project and we were doing that. He started writing a whole other set of stories that were in Abu Dhabi where he was at the time in all other places and then we connect in to Alaska. So it became this more global story. It wasn't as Alaska centric, but it was still very Alaskan. Uh, and I want to ask Patrick to do that, but I want to make sure we also have time for Melissa to talk about it. And um, one of the big things that came out in this project that we matriculated over to shared universe is um, when you look at the people we have that wrote stories, you know, it's a, it's a broad section of Alaska, some people were born and raised here, some people moved here, some people had, I think Skywalker was less than a month or two into being Alaskan. Um, Patrick has stayed here, but hasn't lived here. So there's, there's things about all the different Alaskan cultures that we started discussing with each other. If you're gonna talk, uh, there's a responsibility you have if you're gonna write a story that involves say an indigenous culture or an indigenous language, how do you do that in a way um, that's sincere and that has good intentions and that is good for the people of Alaska? How do we promote the people of Alaska inside of, of this? How do we hold each other up? How do we hold each other accountable for what we're saying, what we're doing, what we're using? Um, and so I, I, a lot of the conversations that came out of that 
I, I feel very happy about that people were able to say that. Um, and then watching the comic books come together now and watching those social practices happen where we're looking at each other like, did you talk to this person? Did you check with this person? This person knows this language or this cultural thing and, and, and looking at each other. Uh, so we did our best at the time to also provide this kind of information for Patrick as he wrote his story. Would you like to chat a little bit about that, Patrick? Let's see here. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, I you know, already mentioned about, you know, how my interest in, in Alaska and all things Alaska, you know, based came out of my family's culture. But I think the one thing that really kind of frames, you know, a lot of what I did, it had to do with a conversation with when I first came up because I was from Chicago at the time. And the thing is, is that when we were, going in there, uh, the, you know, the, the, um, the term Chichaco, you know, basically had, you know, was about, you know, the notion of, you know, oh, here's some guy up from Chicago, you know, who's, you know, basically going on and either acting like a carpet bag or just, you know, talking about this, that, or the other thing. And the thing is, is that I think to me, that was something that really uh, influenced me a great deal you know, because of the fact that when I wrote the archive, um, which to me is actually a commentary on global global colonialism, you know, is the notion of this idea that uh, I'm not very explicit about it, but the no, but the notion is is that you know the um, I'm answering Bruce Sterling's idea of 22nd century fiction, and of course going into climate fiction, and you know we're basically crossing between um, you know, the, the projects Nathan found and, you know, kind of like seventies dome tropes, like, uh, silent running in Logan's run as, you know, these ideas in which you could seal off a culture. And I, I almost kind of saw these, these, these global archives in which humanity's, um, uh, knowledge was going to be tucked away, you know? And then the thing is, is that what, you know, the larger population didn't know was that as humanity was going to see whether CO2 was going to run away or not, you know, the archives were about to close. And then, you know, as kind of like, um, you know, kind of a neo-colonial sort of thing. The one thing is, is that um, also another thing that I, I kind of got into were, you know, was basically kind of looking at my, my position and then also my study of things like Onunga um, and um, legends and that sort of thing, conversations with people like David uh, Karabelnikov, um, you know, and my time in ADAC. Uh, you know, basically the thing is, is that I knew, I knew my position. And then the other thing is, is that the way I wrote the archive was, you know, in this idea of this um, infinite universe in which different universes were talking to each other and, and envisioning each other. So in, in that way, in my kind of weird position, I saw this as maybe a way in which I could at least structure what I was trying to do as a format for infinite inclusiveness of, of an infinite number of envisionings of, of these sorts of things. And the places where I had been like, uh, you know, Central Asia and Arabia and, um, you know, the Far East and uh, even touching into Africa and possibly bringing these things into, you know, a sort of, um, you know, um, global post-colonial, you know, dialogue through this notion of 22nd century um, science fiction. The thing is, is that for me, because of the fact that I wasn't raised in Alaska and I might, I just have family you know, were, who were part of Alaska is the fact that one of the things that I looked at is this idea of abstraction that comes from the 22nd century. And the fact that um, like in, in my story, California broke off from the United States, it went bankrupt and was brought up by Korea and it's now called East Korea. So the thing is, is I'm making certain allusions to the future in that there are abstractions and pluralities and cross pollinations in which um, in my universe, um, I'm trying to speak for my characters as best as I know, because as best as I know, without trying to speak for anyone else, because of the fact that um, you know, I real I'm taking this conceit of the idea that there 
the world in the 22nd century, you know, may have had different influences that, um, you know, that create something that, you know, we, we just, we just don't know yet while this has been a process for me to listen and learn and, you know, articulate, I think what I would say a, at the same time, a dystopian and, and a hopeful future, you know, in, on one hand, I'm talking about a dystopia, but on the other hand, is that underneath it is a, a hopefulness in that there is a resilience and a plurality of humanity that, that, that comes forth from our own um, consciousness, I guess. And, um, you know, uh, currently I have actually on the, on the books about five or six more, more stories that are pretty far reaching and I hope that I hope that I write them. But the one thing is, is that, um, you know, after, you know, Nathan and I, you know, had, you know, spent time and, and worked on these, you know, worked on uh, the initial scaffold on this is the fact that, um, you know, um, I, th I think what happens for me is that, you know, ta uh, tackling issues like, you know, the potential uh, six, you know, the, the potential of the sixth extinction, you know, how this could wind up in a neocolonial situation, how to construct a story like this that, you know, isn't drawing walls, has a very open format. And the thing is, is still has a general respect for, you know, the, the people who I have a general interest in, because the thing is that they touched my family's life. And, um, you know, and then the other thing is, is that also such a deep respect for, you know, Nathan's work, you know, in AR in Alaska. Um, you know, I guess the thing, I guess the thing is, is that, you know, building this idea of, uh, you know, of the archaeological, you know, nation, uh, idea of these domes, the idea how that they could comment on, you know, post-colonial society. And basically the thing is gently, you know, uh, gently play with my um, my learning of you know Alaskan cultures, like what the was it the uh, the the was it the the Weekel? you know the uh, the oh the the beluga hunting platform yeah which was one yeah. it, which 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 I thought was so bizarre that they have that uh, diorama in the uh, you know in in the uh, in the uh, Anchorage. Um, airport and to me i thought that was just such a um interesting that's, bizarre thing that's actually a good a good segue here for so the, yeah. uh, melissa the court that was uh joel isaac made that diorama for the the denina yeah. show which is like this incredible piece of denina culture sorry about the bell i'm had to take a break at school uh i melissa's this incredible artist like she's just this wonderful human on top of that uh she's a quintessential part of the shared universe group um but i always love listening to her talk and one of the things that i would like to ask her to to talk about and asia would as well i'm gonna speak for asia here too uh because it was asia's prompt a while back there's a responsibility a lot of us have when we fantasize and imagine on top of Alaska. It, we're, we're placing our fantasies on a land that's um, it, it, that's indigenous land and there's responsibility, um, but th there's more than that. There's all sorts of things. Could you speak about what those things mean? What, what do we do to going forward? Yeah, and you know, I think I just wanted to like make a note of something that you said earlier, Nathan, was that, you know, having that everyone kind of in this group was sort of made aware of like their responsibilities, right, as as far as to the thousands and thousands of years of history in Alaska, right? I mean, um, you know, I talk about it a lot that according to archaeological record, you know, and that's that's the Western sort of record, Native people have been here for 15,000 years, and that's before the pyramids, that's before written language, that's so old, that's such an ancient, ancient, um, you know, uh, catalog of histories and stories that are still, that are available, you know, um, just of course not in the, uh, the transmission of written language, um, uh, which, you know, it, 
is still yet to be uh, determined on whether what is superior. Um, so I think that uh, in some ways, you know, imagining a future in science fiction, you know, on top of on top of kind of like already this this sort of like rich history. It's interesting to kind of see what sort of stories came out, you know, particularly in the books, right? Um, you know, I, I I've only read the read the books as a as a as a reader, as an audience member, you know. But hearing all of you, you know, in this book club that we're essentially creating, you know, it's it's interesting because I think that in in our writing and in our creation, we always give an extension of ourselves, you know, an extension of our ideas and our thoughts, you know, I heard that so much with like Vivian and with Richard, you know, and um, this idea of, you know, we ended with Patrick, right, talking about neocolonialism, you know, which is, which in, in many ways is essentially like uh, various forms of imperialism and extraction, right, and um, you know, this, I, I think it's interesting. I'd love to talk to him more about kind of this purity that he sees because, you know, that's not exactly what I see. And so I, I wonder too, like in imagining these futures, you know, what, in what ways are we uh, making note that there's so much havoc and there's so much, you know, uh, upheaval that happens, you know, in this idea of, of imagining a future um, outside of, indigenous ways of being, which is truly the most sustainable way of being in Alaska, you know, and how is it that we can we address those, those, those ideas, you know, um, you know, I, I like I definitely want to dive more into like what Lucas was talking about of, you know, like the, the corporations like creating this sort of like subhuman wolf man, you know, and, um, you know, definitely uh, Vivian it's interesting. It's just repeat. It's just a, a repetition of different colonial practices that have already happened upon indigenous people and atrocities, you know, in the human zoo. And, you know, so, yeah, it's, I, I think we need to have another like dirigibles book club. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? It feels like this is right where the conversation needed to be for us to have the, the, the actual deep conversation on the, yeah. Absolutely. And we're right at the top of the hour where I know people need to go. But what I want to ask you to do, if you can, whether it's in the chat or um, in an email to Nathan, to whom I know you're all connected, is just to take a moment after we sign off and write down the questions and the ideas that are kind of looming in your mind right now. It could be anybody who's listening in, certainly. But please, the artists who are directly a part of this project, that is a very exciting place to um, position ourselves for the next conversation. Yeah. Do, 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 would it be worth continuing this the next time we do a book club meeting? Because I, I feel... Well, I'm as enthusiastic as anyone might be in the room, so... <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it would be great. Uh, I, I, it would be nice to bring Leslie and Skywalker and other people who weren't able to participate also into the conversation. Yes. Um, let's, think, yeah. Let's do that, but let's frame that conversation. And if you need to go, go ahead and do it. But will you make a note to yourself, each of you who are present, to um, or pause in this chat box to frame some questions that you know you sort of find yourself at at this point in the dialogue, so we can pick it up right at this really rich place where we've arrived at today. And again, I want to thank you all so much for the work that you're doing and the time that you've taken to participate in this dialogue. Really looking forward to continuing it and um, be well until next time. Yes, uh, Adrian, can I say, I'm going to make sure everybody can get a digital copy of this. You guys will put up some links so that way if people wanted to keep following the conversation, they're able to read them. That's right. So this conversation, you'll be able to see it in a few minutes on Facebook Live, but you'll also be able to find it. Anybody can find it at benellarts.org under Inspiration and Adaptation. There's an archive now of nearly 50 conversations, and this will be the most recent one. You can listen to it again and just sort of review the questions that occur to you, and we'll move forward in our next book club, Shared Universe, pick up some of these conversations. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care and be well. Thank you so much.